This DVD has been rated by the producers as PG. Parental guidance is recommended for young viewers. D. It contains images of drug references and drug use. E. For educational purposes. We can't show you his face. He's about to get high. Jake's friend is smoking ice, the crystallised supercharged speed, the purest form of methamphetamine. It was a decision made by the Aboriginal Legal Rights Movement Board. Um, we had our meeting in September and there was great concerns um, being raised by our community board members about the issue of ice within our communities um, and the devastating impact it's actually having on our communities, just with our families, our grandmothers, our elders, but also on um, our young people and adults who are now offending as a result of their addictions. But this is the uncertainty and this is what's happening in our community and our, our women and our men and our older men are frightened of a repercussion such as a meeting as this. And that's one of the reasons why I brought it up at the Aboriginal Legal Rights Movement. We need to confront this issue and it doesn't matter who's out there, who's selling it. I think if we all get around and all support one another, we can start to defeat this issue. But the other way, the only way we can defeat this is that we really need to unite as one because this is a killer problem that we have in our community. It doesn't discriminate against age, sex, or nationality. Young Aboriginal kids take it, young Aboriginal kids die. Older people take it, they die. And it's really destroying our community. So why is crystal meth so popular? The high is longer lasting than with other stimulants. It can be smoked to give a rapid high, taken orally 30 to 60 minutes to get the high. If snorted, it takes two to five minutes to get the high. When injected or smoked, there is an instant high. It's easy to find and it's cheap. It gives high energy. There's a lack of fatigue, wakefulness and enhanced performance. There's a feeling of joy, power, success high self-esteem. There's an increased sexual desire and interest and, sadly, weight loss. Some of the acute problems some users experience include delusional thinking, paranoia, violent behaviour. They can experience itching, welts on the skins, impulsive decision-making, nausea, vomiting, diarrhoea. They can have raised blood pressure, 
increased heart rate, body temperature, increased risk of stroke. Uncontrolled body movements, seizures, these can be fatal. At the end of the high, the users experience tweaking, which is, at, as the high ends, users feel miserable and uncomfortable and may be very hard to deal with, possibly even violent. The crash leads to one to three days of sleeping. Chronic behaviour can lead to disturbed sleep, social isolation and withdrawal from society and friends and family, paranoia and violent behaviour, irritability, nervousness, distractibility, difficulty focusing and remembering things, extreme depression and suicidal thoughts, possible problems with thinking, memory, concentration and movement caused by changes in brain chemistry and nerve pathways. When approaching a user, at the end of the high, users are miserable and sometimes paranoid. It is recommended to maintain safe distance between seven to 10 feet. Closeness may be considered threatening. Calm things down, lower your voice, speak clearly and slowly. Try and reassure them that things are normal and this is part of the withdrawal. Make no jerky movements, keep hands visible and keep the room dimly lit. During the crash at the end of the high, users will sleep and are not usually dangerous unless their sleep is disturbed. During the detoxification process, very little physical withdrawal comes from crystal meth. The treatment focuses on response to acute, urgent and medical needs that are associated with meth use and not with the withdrawal from meth. Some of the possible health issues for crystal meth users include the need to sleep, infection from open sores, blood pressure and temperature fluctuations, and general physical exhaustion. Emotional withdrawal can last for weeks or even months. Symptoms can include depression, anxiety, paranoia, loss of motivation, low energy, and an extreme craving for the drug. In aiding recovery, you can help the person to keep on a simple, understandable, predictable and repetitive schedule. Try to provide clear, simple instructions and simple and repetitive tasks. Make sure they sleep and drink fluids for at least the first 48 hours. Then they sleep for three hours, wake up to have fluids and go back to sleep again. Gradually introduce nutritional meals. You may need to use these steps for two or three weeks before the person is physically and mentally able to start working on the addiction itself. Remember to remind them that the brain and body need time to heal. Re-establish a normal pattern of living without the drug and help the person to find other support and guidance. The Granny Group Gloucestershire came about because of concerns in the community with the drug and alcohol. Our children, our sons and daughters, mm. every member on the Granny's Group has got someone on drugs. Mm. And um, that's what brought us together and that's what keeps us together. And we meet on a fortnightly basis for the last 16 years and we're still going. I came to this forum because um, it enlightened me on all matters about us. And um, what knowledge I got from here, I could take back to, if I go down to see family in Millicent or anywhere else, I carry on uh, uh, and share the knowledge with them.
Uh, crystal meth, as, as, as the DVD said, is a stimulant. It's basically produced in backyards and things like that. It can be made um, with ingredients, uh, bought in local drug and hardware stores. Um, just recently, a couple of years ago, uh, uh, methamphetamine here in South Australia. Um, sorry. Here in South Australia, uh, methamphetamine uh, has now become the uh, overtaking heroin and cannabis as uh, the drug of choice amongst uh, regular injecting drug users. So what I'm looking at in this particular presentation is the impact of illegal drug laboratories in communities in terms of the types of chemicals that can be handled, the types of impacts they may have, and the types of residues we might see as well. I'm from uh, Flinders University. I've been there for 20 years doing this kind of research, looking at a whole range of different chemicals. And we only moved into the, um, the illegal drug laboratory component when we started to collaborate with Housing SA. So much of the work I'm going to show you today relates to work that we've been doing with Housing SA. And we know that meth popular. You heard from other people who've said the first thing is it's addictive. It's a central nervous system stimulant, so people take it to get a kick or a high. It's very versatile in the way it can be administered. Unlike other drugs, it can be smoked, it can be ingested, it can be inhaled, or it could be um, inje in ingested, injected. So there's a whole range of ways it can be prepared to facilitate its consumption. And that also means it may be more convenient for transport, for sale, for packaging, and all these other things that may be important to the people who are making these drugs. It's very easy to produce. When I give this talk in universities, I talk to undergraduate students, it's not a how-to guide, but it's not hard. It's often only a three-step process, and they can make drugs in their own kitchen. And it's relatively inexpensive. Not just to buy, which is going to be dependent on market forces within that sub-community, but also to produce. We also see the problems of the chemicals being used in synthesis exacerbated further by the types of equipment that are used. What that means is, is that with restrictions on the availability of glassware and laboratory equipment, it means that people have to make do and they become very inventive in the things that they do. It's not like Breaking Bad where you get a UPU laboratory and everything is all clean and shiny. What we see is people making a reaction vessel like this made of two soft drink bottles with the glass tube that's part of, of um, a fluorescent tube. Now this is used as a reflux condenser, and the way this is used is it normally sits on top of a reaction vessel which gets heated. And as it boils, the gases and vapors generated go up the tube and they condense and fall back into the tube. So they're confined in that reaction vessel. Now if this was an authentic piece of drug, of um, laboratory equipment, we could rely on that particular process. But if they fail to fill these um, bottles with ice, as you boil the material in the container below, it will be released to the atmosphere at high concentrations. And so we see lots of people exposed during failure of their ad hoc equipment that they have made themselves. They also have skin contact, and some of the work we're now moving on to is measuring the amount of contact we need with skin to be able to get a toxic amount of not just methamphetamine, but these other chemicals into the system. The chemicals, once they're on surfaces, will persist. We've measured <coughs> repeatedly in houses for housing SA and found methamphetamine at high concentrations for over six months if they're not treated. So that means that you could have a house that's been a drug laboratory. The people have packed up and gone, nobody knew. The next family come along and they're exposed. Some more recent work, I have a PhD student who's just finishing her work now. She's working based in Sydney, but she did some work here in Western Australia. And she's got two case studies of children in homes which were in laboratories, which were laboratories, but nobody knew. And they have psychological problems, and they have health problems associated with their exposure, which we've monitored by taking hair clippings from the children and monitoring the amount of methamphetamine in their hair. So the amounts that they can be exposed to are considerable. And these are the unwitting exposures in people not involved in drug manufacture. Now, the next people who may be exposed are the emergency response teams, the police, fire, ambulance. If they find a laboratory, they have to deal with it. And that means shutting down the laboratory in a way that doesn't allow runaway reactions to take place to cause more problems. 
It means that they can remove materials which we use as evidence to make them safe. But the problem is for the police is that many of the cases that we, they see are chance discoveries. That is, a, a warrant may be issued to see somebody for a different reason. So the police officer arrives on the premises and they find a drug laboratory which is active. They're potentially exposed. They're also at risk of injury and, um, and uh, uh, attack from the people who are in those premises when they're, they're being located with the drug laboratory. So the, the emergency responders are, are front line in many of these cases. They're a sensitive subgroup for a variety of reasons. They get exposed to chemicals in their home because their parents are involved in drug manufacture. They may suffer needle stick and other punctures because their parents may be also taking other injectable type drugs. They may suffer physical and sexual abuse at the hands of their parents or their parents' associates. And they may suffer neglect and other problems associated with withdrawal. So as a group, they're a very vulnerable group. In South Australia, in 2003, we found that there were children at 8 out of 46 laboratories detected. And there was evidence of children at many of the others. So more than two-thirds of the laboratories had evidence of children being present. Children are at greater risk when they are exposed to chemicals than are adults because they have a greater body size to weight ratio. That means that they have more surface area per, per kilogram of mass. And that means that they can absorb more chemical, and it means their relative dose is higher. It means that a dose that may be harmless for an adult may be life-threatening for a child. And the exposures take place at a very busy formative period during the physiology. There are biochemical, hormonal, and neurological changes taking place, which can be permanently altered by their exposures, not just to methamphetamine. Remember those side effect type kind of chemicals that are also produced. If you get these, then you can have permanent seizure potential in children. This is um, not just a policing issue, this is a health issue, this is a community issue, and the more we are able as a community to talk about these issues, that the better off we are. And uh, unfortunately, this type of drug does not uh, discern between uh, who you are or what you are. It affects all uh, areas of the community, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you're Aboriginal, whether you're white or whatever. It uh, affects everybody. So uh, we're all facing the same problems. This is an example of seizures that have been analysed by <coughs> forensic science. So if you go back to 2010, 2011, you can see that the far greater amount that was seized was powders. There's a little bit of paste and there's a little bit of crystals. Then in 2011, 2012, we saw a drop from powders, more going in towards crystal and paste. <coughs> and then in 2012, 2013, there's slight uh, rise again in powders, but crystals and paste were still uh, about uh, correlating with the previous year. And in 2013, 2014, this is what we had tested from seized drugs, and the majority was crystal, which is ice. So you can see that within the community, people are buying ice or producing ice because uh, it's a uh, better way of making profit. This is some commonly found equipment uh, that you may find if you go into a house where people are cooking. Now you've got glass beakers, condensers, heating mantles. All these glassware are illegal to have. But uh, I'll have them all set up. They might have them stored in the suitcases, hidden up in the ceilings, you know, under beds, whatever. And if they're being used, they're contaminated. And uh, put the people within that uh, the, uh, area, you know, within that home or whatever, at risk from health issues. Grandparents, especially the grandmothers, are there picking up the parenting lot. Mm. Uh, and that's a big issue and uh, I saw on the television the other day that uh, about the health, especially within the Aboriginal community, of grandmothers where they're not looking after themselves because they're looking after everybody else within the family group. So which is a big issue and I suppose you've spoken about that this morning. But also there's a risk to social services that go to these premises to check on welfare or whatever, maybe trying to help, but because of paranoia of the offender, they feel at risk so they don't go there. 
So what can you do as a community? You know, if it's something like you think a lab is happening right there and then, you know, one three one triple four, and get the police around and we'll get there. But if you want to make it uh, anonymously, or you don't think, look, there's some information, you may want it to come through to us that we can follow up. Crime stoppers, and it can be done online. I think what we haven't spoken today about is why people do use. And I think there's a culture around methamphetamine use. And uh, it was touched on earlier on, and, people's, and people who use meth, they often don't see themselves as drug users. And they don't see them, they, you know, the quotes would be, I'm not a junkie, or I can get off it whenever I like. It's not causing me problems. So the level of insight that people have often into their ice use is not all that great. And when you look at the benefits from it that they see, um, they'll tell you that it gives them more energy, enables them to do things, enables them to stay up and get things done, get to work. Uh, it, if they feel guilt or shame, it gets rid of that. Um, if they're feeling depressed, it elevates their mood, they feel more powerful. If, so they felt disempowered. So, you know, when you look at the benefits that people claim they get from methamphetamine, it's not, you know, the question is why isn't everybody taking it? Because it's a very seductive, good looking drug for a lot of people. So, I think, you know, we can talk about treatment services, and I'll acknowledge that there aren't enough treatment services in South Australia, but we're similar to most of the other jurisdictions. I think they're underdone considerably in, in Australia. But I think part of the issue is how do we change the culture around methamphetamine use, even amongst those people who use it on a regular basis but don't develop significant problems with it. You know, because they're the, they're the people who, you know, it's, it's us who normalise it in a way. A lot of people take it, they function okay on it, but they don't see the problems associated with it, similar to alcohol in a way. We need to deal with this and deal with this effectively. Unfortunately, like I've been saying in the in the meeting, this is not a law and justice issue. This is an health issue, and we'll have to deal with it and continue to deal with it. We're not going to solve it today, tomorrow, or the next day. It's just that we have to continue on and continue to work. And at the end of the day, try to lobby governments about changing uh, policies and legislations in relation to uh, drugs and drugs in our community and decriminalise it along the lines of Portugal where programs were developed from decriminalising the program, uh, drug programs, the reduction of uh, incarceration, the reduction of uh, deaths from drugs and the saving of money that went back into rehabilitative programs. So that's what we're open to deal with and open to get you out of this meeting and put to the uh, state government in the very near future.